Good evening, and welcome to Esports 101. I'm David Rabinovich, and I'll be your professor for this lecture. You might be thinking to yourself, who is this guy, and why is he trying to teach me esports? Well, I'll have you know, I've been in the community for a long time as a commentator and as a writer. Each episode of Esports 101 will focus on a different esport. Today, it's League of Legends. Little game, might have heard of it, 30 million daily players. This lecture will be broken down into six segments. The first two will be about gameplay and strategy. Then we'll move on to the broadcast. And last, we'll take a look at sponsorship, leagues, tournaments, and my favorite, the seven deadly sins of league. This lecture will also have question and answer periods split out throughout, so don't be afraid to ask whatever you want in the thread. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Also, be sure to interact with us on social media and check out our Gleam campaign. We have a $100 Amazon gift card on the line, along with $50 worth of Riot points. Yeah, I know, pretty sick. With all that out of the way, let's get right into it. League of Legends is a team-based strategy game where the goal is for you and four other teammates to bring down your enemy's nexus, all while defending your own at the same time. Think of the nexus as the heart of your base, almost like a castle that you have to defend. Sadly, there is no prince or princess to awaken with true love's first kiss. The game itself has no time constraint and lasts until one team brings down the other's nexus. Just like going over your grandma's for only one slice of pie, the task is easier said than done. In League, the characters are known as champions, and every game starts by choosing a champion from a list of 139, all of which have their own strengths and weaknesses. There are three main types of champions, marksmen, tanks, and mage mages or assassins. However, not all champions fall into one single category. Some are hybrids that lend themselves to a particular style of gameplay. Each champion has a different number of health and mana or energy points, and this base number will change based on what type of champion you select. If you choose a tank, your champion will have a higher base health points, and thus will be harder to kill. Whereas if you select a mage, you will have higher mana or energy, which will allow you to cast more spells. When choosing a champion, it's important to think what style of gameplay you want to play. If you're a fan of cowering behind your muscular friends, perfect! You can pick the ranged marksman who fires away from a distance. Or maybe you're a connoisseur of defending your cowering friends. In that case, you can pick a strong, burly fighter to go all in with no remorse. Or you can choose the unusual subcategory of mages and assassins that cast powerful spells or do cool card tricks in front of their opponents. However you want to get things done, someone is out there for you, unlike Lava Life or eHarmony. After everyone has selected their character, you and your four teammates will appear in the fountain. Kick your feet up, stay a while. This is going to be what you will be calling home. While this is a nice place to take a drink of water, this is also where you will respawn if your champion dies during battle. While this fountain does not provide you with youth, it does house the item shop. At the beginning of the game, you'll start off with a little bit of gold, and you can use this gold to buy items. These items will act as perks or power-ups for your champion in battle, and some items might even give you faster attack speed, more armor, or faster health regeneration, to name a few examples. There are even boots to give you faster movement speed, and I know, I know you've been eyeing them Jordans for a while. As the game progresses, you will get more gold, and you can return to the fountain to buy better items, giving you an even stronger boost for that extra edge in battle. Once you've bought your starting items, you'll head out into the mystical world of League of Legends known as Summoner's Rift. Each game is played on the same map, which, frankly, between you and me, might be the only simple thing about this game. The map is broken up into three lanes, commonly called bot for bottom, mid for middle, and top, well, for top, real original, yeah. Um, each lane is a path between the two bases guarded by a set of powerful turrets. You'll need to destroy your enemy's turrets if you want to get into their base and take down their nexus. Remember the nexus? Your lost friend who happens to be the princess, the heart, everything your team is trying to protect, but also the enemy has one and you need to destroy it to end the game? Nexus, you darn old thing. Between the lanes is the jungle, a shadowy area filled with powerful neutral monsters who aren't on either team. But don't poke the bear and expe not expect a grisly future. These monsters can beat the heck out of an unprepared champion, 
Slaying these creatures, however, will give you gold to buy items, experience to level up, and on occasion, some pretty sweet temporary perks. A line dissects the map into half between the two teams. This is called the river. Within the river, there are two powerful neutral bosses that are highly sought out after, one on each side. But don't worry about them just yet. We'll get back to them in a sec. Understanding the ins and outs of the map is important. Experienced players know where things are relatively safe and where things can get a little hairy. The last time I've seen a map this useful was probably on Dora the Explorer. Well, you're out and about trying to figure it out and your items are giving you hella clout. So how do you get stronger? How do you crush your enemies? Well, there are two ways to do just that. The first way is to gain experience. You gain experience by being in the same area as enemies when they die. After killing enough enemies, you will level up with the max level being level 18. Every time you level up, you're given an ability point to improve one of your champion's abilities. Your champion has five different abilities. The first three abilities are known as the Q, W, and E abilities, named to represent how to trigger them on the keyboard. A champion also has an ultimate ability and a passive ability. The ultimate ability is triggered with the R key, while the passive ability isn't triggered by a key. It's actually always active and cannot be improved with ability points. For example, here you can see Karthus, one of the 139 champions to pick from, has a passive that allows him to stay alive for a couple of extra seconds after death. All abilities have a cooldown period, meaning they cannot really be unleashed until a certain time after each use. Ability cooldowns can vary from champion to champion, but the rule of thumb is between 1 to 20 seconds. The ultimate ability, however, ranges between 1 and 2 minutes, so use it sparingly. Leveling up your abilities makes them stronger and decreases their cooldown. The second way to get stronger is by buying items. Items are bought at the shop, in your team's base as I mentioned before, using gold earned from killing enemies during a match. Once you've purchased an item, it goes straight into your inventory where you immediately gain its benefits. There are items for you to do more damage, such as swords or bows, or take less damage, such as armor or shields. Oh, and of course, those items that help your teammates succeed. But those items are for the nice guys, and we all know nice guys finish last. What do you think of when you hear the word minion? Do you have an adorable yellow character in the back of your head? Erase that immediately. Minions within a game of League are much different. They are computer-controlled units that march relentlessly down all lanes engaging in any enemies in their path. They periodically spawn in waves and they separate, marching down top, mid, and bot. Your opponents have minions too and you're probably going to want to crush them. You get experience when they die, but only the killing blow, commonly known as the last hit, will earn you gold. I, I get it. This might look like the draft of one of my grandpa's new chess pieces for his set. But it's a little more deadly than some semi-professional woodcrafting, okay? Lay your hands off my grandpa. Alongside minions, turrets add some oregano and basil into the mix. They really spice it up. Used to help defend a team's nexus, they need to be destroyed in order to make life easier on yourself and your team. Each squad has 11 turrets, 3 in top, mid, and bot, as well as two parked right in front of the Nexus. While you won't necessarily have to destroy them all, the way in which you attack them is very important. The targeting priorities of the turret are also very specific and important to understand if you want to stay alive. As you can see here, this glowing circle will represent the idea of what the range is like around the turret. But when you are actually in the game, this circle does not show. This circle is like training wheels. You're already 11 years old, Terrence. It's time to ride a bike. Once you and your minions roll up to an enemy turret, you have a few moments to damage it while it focuses your minions. If you are in range of the turret without your minions, it will then decide to attack you. If you attack an enemy champion, however, within the range of the turret, it will change its focus entirely on you, even if your minions are around to support you. Working with your minions to siege enemy turrets is your main objective if you're looking to reach the Nexus. And yes, I know, for the hundredth time, it's easier said than done. But make sure to watch out for enemies' champions too. Like you, they have items, abilities, and their own minions to call on to help stop you rolling up. Protect your neck, sis. 
the inevitable end, death. We're all dying, obviously, but in League of Legends, death is only temporary. Don't feel bad about running headfirst into the entirety of the opposing team. Only worry about the aftermath of your team yelling at you. If your champion dies, you'll have to wait for a timer to expire before you're thrown right back into the mix at your base's fountain. As the game goes on, the length of time you have to wait before respawning increases. However, early on in the game, it only requires a few seconds of patience. Thankfully, killing your enemies also takes them off the map, giving you the perfect opportunity to either take a turret or show them how sportsmanlike you are. The hardest part of understanding what is going on is understanding each individual champion. While we obviously can't go through all 139 of them, we can go through one champion kit just to give you a little bit of a framework. Just a reminder, all champions have a passive ability that is always available. They have three base abilities that can be activated via the Q, W, and E keys, and an ultimate ability activated with the R key. Let's jump into our champion kit now that we know the basics. We're going to be going over the Dark Child, otherwise known as Annie. So let's start things off by talking a little bit about her Q ability that's called Disintegrate. Disintegrate is an ability in which Annie throws a fireball at her target. Moving on to her W ability, Incinerate, Annie will release a cone of fire in the direction that you select, dealing damage to all enemies within the cone. Then we have her E ability, Molten Shield. Annie wraps herself in a fiery aura, reducing damage taken for a few seconds. Enemies who attack Annie during this time will also be dealt damage back. Next is her passive called Pyromania. After casting four abilities, Annie's next ability will stun enemies as it damages them. And last, but definitely not least, Annie's ultimate ability on the R key is Tibbers. Annie carries around a little teddy bear, and when she activates this ability, a giant flaming bear, yes, named Tibbers, spawns and is controlled entirely by her. The initial spawn does a lot of damage to surrounding enemies, and then Tibber likes to just take long walks on the beach and help Annie clean up some of the enemies that are left remaining. This is just one of the many examples that League of Legends has to offer in their champions. Well, yes, I understand, this is a lot to absorb, but really, that's the basics of League of Legends. You get money, buy stuff, and wreck a base all while battling against a team of opponents trying to do the same exact thing to you. The combination of skill, speed, and intelligence will lead you to the opponent's nexus and a victory. Then, you can start a new game and do it all over again. Now, the moment you've been waiting for, I'm sure you have tons of questions and I've got the answers. But before we do that, before we dive right into some of the questions that you guys have had throughout the chat, we're going to talk a little bit about the Gleam giveaway, some of the other stuff that you might see on the Facebook stream or on the Twitch stream. But let's dive right into that. For all of you Facebook users, what I'm about to say applies primarily to Twitch users, but we can kind of float the boat the same way. For Twitch users, you'll notice that below you are three panels. Below the, the stream that you see, correct. There's going to be three panels, one of which is going to link to our Facebook. If you want to go see the Facebook live stream there, by all means, just go ahead. The second panel on the Twitch stream is the Gleam giveaway. For those of you that have, might not have been participating with the giveaway that we've had so far, um, we're giving away a $100 Amazon gift card as well as $50 worth of Riot points. Um, to those of you who play League of Legends, that's a lot of Riot points. If you haven't participated in the Gleam giveaway yet, perfect time to start. The, the cutoff time is 9 p.m., so we have a couple, we have about an hour before we're locking off the ballots and we're going to pick a winner at the end of the stream. Um, for those of you that have gotten your ballots in, mind you, we have added some new opportunities to get your ballots in, so make sure to go to that Glean giveaway. It's in the panel below. If you're on Facebook, uh, I believe Esports 101 has commented with the Twitch link as well as the Glean giveaway. The last and final uh, question, um, sorry, panel below the stream is the question panel, uh, which links to our donation subset on Twitch, uh, which allows you to donate if you have any questions. Feel free. Um, we're going to be fielding those a lot better than, than before. But for you guys, just for you guys, you know, for the safety of your own, uh, you know, giveaway GBs, uh, can, can I get my, my intern to come in? Intern? Intern? Thank you. 
Thanks, Vic. Uh, you see, these are real. These bad boys are real. Oh, this is upside down. We've got, got the riot points right here, and we've got the, uh, oh, I'm upside down. We've got the riot points right here, and we've got the Amazon gift card, but who needs those? Um, let's get into our first question and answer some of the stuff that you guys might have uh, in, related, in relation to that section that we just saw. One of the first questions that we have comes from one of the Twitch users. How often or when should a person go back to shop? It's a great question. Um, when you start the game, you start in the fountain, so that's your first kind of exposure to the shop. So you can obviously you know, connect with the shop there. Um, then you go out to your lanes, which we'll talk about a little bit about in our next segment. Um, but uh, when you die, you have the opportunity to visit the shop. You can visit the shop when you're dead. And then when you respawn, you can also visit the shop. Sometimes dying is a good way to go back to the shop. But uh, one thing that I didn't cover in the basics of the game is that you have a recall option. Uh, when you press the B key on your keyboard, um, after a few seconds, it teleports you back to the fountain. And then you got to walk back to, to lane. You don't get the luxury of teleporting back. Um, but recalling back after you think it's a nice time or you feel like, ah, oh, you just killed somebody, maybe now's a good time. You know, there's, there's a couple of key, um, key moments that after playing for a while or after seeing for a while, you'll, you'll start to see a pattern of when people start to recall and go back and maybe shop a little bit. Um, let's see. Next question. We have another question uh, from Twitch. This time it's from a user called Oh My God, It's Legacy. Beautiful name. What are the main differences between this and Dota 2? And what is your personal preference? Well, Dota 2 um, is another game that's very similar to League of Legends. Um, the genre, you know how m many of you might know about Call of Duty or Super Smash Brothers, but the, the genre for Call of Duty is called FPS, which stands for First Person Shooter. The genre for League of Legends is called MOBA, which stands for Massive Online Battle Arena. Um, Dota is another MOBA genre style game, but some might argue it's a little bit more difficult than League of Legends. My personal preference is obviously League of Legends. Dota 2 is a crazy, wacky, wild game, and I mean, kudos to it for um, the scene and the tournament uh, leagues and all that jazz that they've been able to develop over the past several years. But I wouldn't say that they really butt heads. Like these two, League of Legends and Dota, are, I think um, they just share the spotlight whenever they can. Um, but yeah, my personal preference is League of Legends, personally. We have a Facebook question from a good friend of mine, Jordan. Uh, he asks, um, you mentioned that you, there are 139 champions. Which champion would you su suggest for a first-time player like myself? Um, so Riot releases these things called starter packs every now and then, and pretty much... Um, the starter packs. You know what? Let's let's actually uh, let's take a quick look at some visuals. I want to have a look at that screen where we have all those champions listed, and maybe we can kind of go over. Maybe I can point out a couple for you guys. Let's walk on over back to our little teaching section over here, and we'll have a quick look at some of the champions, uh, some of the list listed champions that we saw in, in one of the earlier segments. So you see here, we have just probably A to D. This is only just a chunk, um, but as I was mentioning earlier, Riot likes to release these things called starter packs. And essentially, these starter packs are a kit of champions. It gives you, so, it gives you eight champions that are relatively easy to use. Uh, you might see something like Garen. You might see something like Ash. Uh, if anything that I see from here, uh, Udyr is another very, very simple to use champion. There's not really too much mechanical difficulty uh, when you pick him up. Uh, there's also other characters like uh, Rise, Ash, Annie, even Annie that we mentioned earlier is quite an easy to use champion. Um, and it also depends on the type of play style that you're looking to accomplish. Do you want to kill everybody? Do you want to uh, be the hero that defends everybody? It's really up to you. Um, but some of the champions that I've listed are pretty much good to go uh, for you in any type of role that you want to fit. Like they, they're, some of the champions that I mentioned are kind of multi-talented. Let's head on over back to our question and answer section uh, just to see what other sections, uh, what other questions rather that we got um, from you guys. Twitch, another Twitch question. Do they have jungle min minions like in Dota? Short answer to that question is yes. The long answer to that question is I'm not entirely sure what some of the perks that they give. I know that they have their own final boss 
uh, which we will talk about in our next seg segment. But they all have their they have their own final boss, which you can slay, and it gives you something. But we'll talk about that in our strategy segment. Um, but they all, I don't really know what the other uh, minions do in, in Dota 2, but that is something that we can dive in in another episode of Esports 101. Next question. On Twitch we've had, what key should I keep my flash on? Come on, man. Come on, man. Everybody knows D is for dance, F is for flash. What uh, this person is referring to is in League of Legends, we have something called summoner spells. They're kind of additional spells that you can kit your player out with, and um, there's a handful of them, and you choose them before you start the game. Uh, what flash is, is when you press the button for flash, F, uh, you move a bit forward, like you teleport a little bit forward, a couple of steps forward. Uh, what this is used for is kind of dodging, ducking in and out, if you want to avoid a couple things. Um, that's pretty much what flash is used for, but that's, that's going to be a, that's, that's a good one. Um, next question from Son of Ogre YouTube on Twitch. Do you think Riot's balance team does a pretty good job? I think that Riot has had moments where they've been wild. I think Riot, Riot, Riot is kind of like a young teen growing up. They've had their adult phase. They've had their wild phase. Um, right now, I think the game is in a pretty decent spot. Uh, about a patch or two or three ago, it was horrible. The game was horrible. But with the introduction of the new rune system, I think people are still kind of, kind of working out the kinks. Um, but I think Riot is on a good path. Would I say it's the best path? We'll have to see based on champion usage. That is ultimately what the balance team wants to accomplish. An equal amount of champion usage across the board. We'll have to wait and see until that actually comes true. Next question from buddy of mine, Nico on Facebook. Is there anything I take, anything I can take from games like Call of Duty and apply it to a game like League? Great question. I think that um, one thing that I, I say works for every single eSport game is strategy. If you kind of understand that if, like for example, in Call of Duty, when you're doing Search and Destroy, or you're doing Dominion where you're capturing the flag and yet, or whatever, what have you. Let's, let's just use Search and Destroy as an example. There are two bomb sites, essentially, right? Um, and your team either needs to defend those two bomb sites or they need to plant the bomb and potentially win the game. The thing about that is if your team all goes A and the other team defends B, there's, there's like a rotation of pressure on the map. So like you'll have, you'll be like, oh, I know that they're all B or like I feel like they're all B. Like you kind of know, like it's, it's all about strategy and you can kind of almost relate every single eSport back to chess. Like, is this a good move right now? Should this be the best decision I should be making right now? The problem is with Call of Duty is that it's a shooter and League of Legends is not a shooter. Um, but I'd say one of the primary things that you can take away is probably strategy. How you strategize, what are the best decisions to make. And if you're really good at Call of Duty, it might translate well into decision making once you get comfortable in League of Legends. Uh, last question for this block, and then we're going to head into strategy and gameplay. Question from Tash on Facebook. If you had to choose one champion to represent you on Tinder, what would it be? Oh, okay. Whew. Um, all right. I feel like there's two answers to this question. Uh, the, first que the first answer is aesthetically pleasing, right? Do I, want, do I want a champion that's aesthetically pleasing? Or the second answer to this question is like, do I want, like, if people know League and they see this champion, they're going to be like, oh, okay, he's really good at the video game, right? Like, he's really good at League of Legends. So to answer both questions that I've just made up on the spot, um, the first answer to that Tinder question is, I'd probably put something like Evelyn. Uh, there's a character called Evelyn who looks kind of like a mistress. Wait, wait, I should be putting characters that represent a guy. I'd put Garen. I'll put Garen. Garen's probably the poster boy of League of Legends. He's got long flowing hair. Uh, he's the hero of Demacia, the region in League of Legends where he was appointed a knight, a prince, whatever. Uh, Garen would probably be my choice for aesthetically pleasing because he's like strong, he's buff. Um, all the other, some of the other male characters in this game are like creatures. Maybe it's debatable if they're even male or female. So uh, Garen would probably be my choice. But as far as like telling people like what I play, I'd probably pick like Nau Nautilus or Alistar because uh, those are the two characters that I play. And I'd rather want, I'd want to be honest. I wouldn't want to like beat around the bush and be like, hey, this is who, whatever. Um, before we move on to the next segment, I do want to say that don't forget about the Gleam giveaway. Uh, we still have ballots that you can use, that you can still 
uh, push for and increase your chances of winning that RP card and that Amazon gift card. But without further ado, let's head on to our next segment, Strategy and Gameplay. League is concentrated around what's called a meta. It means the most efficient strategies are constantly changing as the developer Riot Games releases patches that make changes to champions and the gameplay monthly. However, there are foundational concepts that remain the same throughout. Within this meta, there are predetermined roles or positions that the five players on each team can fill. These positions are known as top, jungle, mid, attack damage carry, which will be referred to as ADC, and support. The top laner will primarily select a tankier champion to provide a beefy frontline for your team. Since they have more health points than other champions, they work well as the first line of defense. The jungler is flexible in their role selection, but their responsibility is to destroy the neutral monsters in the jungle. Then, they run around lane to lane, surprising enemy champions and potentially taking them out. Just think of your jungler as your Aunt Margaret. Just when you think your chubby cheeks were safe, BAM! She hits you with the signature pinch and release. The mid position is where you will find all your mages and assassins. Some of the highest damage dealing champions will thrive here, as well as your Uncle Jim and his fancy card tricks. This position is reserved for the highly skilled. The ADC and support role both live out the early stages of the game in the bottom lane. The carry is a fragile, handle with care, marks man or marks woman that needs to be babysat by a support until they get stronger. While the ADC's role is simple to do damage, the support's role is flexible in the sense that players can pick or use a variety of champions to heal, tank, or provide ways to stop the enemy right in their tracks. So, you think you're ready to go out and experiment a little bit, you fired up? Well, hold on to your horses for just a little longer. Before diving headfirst into your first competitive match, your team will go through what's called a pick and ban phase. Both teams will remove five champions for a total of 10 that they do not want to see played in the upcoming match. Your team could pinch a particular set of champions that fit a specific role. Maybe your team wants to remove a handful of assassins or potentially a few healers that can be stressful to deal with. As a result, players need to be able to master a variety of champions in order to be successful. During the pick phase, team one always receives the first pick, followed by two picks from team two, then we'll have two more from team one, and so on and so forth in a snake format. Team two is given the opportunity to always have the last pick, and this is often a great opportunity to grab a counter pick. In other words, one champion that might do particularly well against the team the enemy has selected. I've said it before and I'll say it again, the main objective of all this is to take down the enemy nexus. You know to do that, you need to kill the enemy champions, gain ability points, destroy enemy turrets, blah, 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 blah. Well, here are some of the steps that you can take to make all of that a lot easier. In addition to the players and minions, there are also neutral monsters on the map. These monsters spawn at different times throughout the game. One of those monsters that we're going to dissect first are dragons. And no, Daenerys, no dragons were harmed in the making of this lecture. During a match, one of four dragons spawns in the bottom section of the map, each with a different perk when killed. To start, we have the Infernal Dragon, which increases damage here on the left side, the Cloud Dragon, which increases movement speed, the Ocean Dragon, which increases out of combat healing, and last, the Mountain Dragon increases damage to objectives like turrets or other dragons. When slain, you receive a permanent perk for the rest of the game and can stack these perks if the same dragon appears twice. While the spawning of the dragon is random, at the side of the dragon pit is an emblem that will tell you which dragon will be flying in next. Let's segue to the ugly duckling in the pond. Not only the elephant in the room, but the whole damn herd in the neighborhood. The Rift Herald and Baron, son and father, student and teacher, peanut butter, and jelly. The Rift Herald spawns at the 10 minute mark. Upon slaying the Rift Herald, one teammate can pick up the Herald's eye to hold in their inventory. No, I seriously wish I was joking. It is literally the uh, creature's eye in your inventory. Once a teammate activates the eye, the Herald spawns 
and begins to relentlessly travel down the nearest lane, pushing back enemy defenses until slain. The Herald's general purpose is to headbutt turrets and destroy them with ease. Just imagine Godzilla gunning straight for the Nexus, trying to destroy everything in its path. The eye itself only lasts in your inventory for 4 minutes, so choose carefully when to activate it. If the Rift Herald is not slain by either team, it will disappear at the 19 and 45 second mark, in preparation for the Baron to spawn 15 seconds later. The Baron, when slain, provides a team-wide perk to those alive. This perk empowers your team's minions for extra damage and health whenever you or a teammate are around them. The Baron perk itself lasts for 210 seconds unless an enemy kills you. At that time, you lose the perk entirely until you or your team is able to slay the Baron again. Any member still alive with the perk, however, will still keep it for whatever time remains. In other words, it's not really lost as a team, just individually. Baron will spawn 7 minutes after being slain for you and your team to attempt to take it again. There is one key concept I have yet to mention. If you're not familiar with video games in any capacity, you may not know what Fog of War is. The area surrounding you, your allies, your allied minions, your turrets is what you can see. Past that radius is the Fog of War, an area that you and the enemy team are unable to see unless you have vision. All 10 players have access to wards which provide you vision wherever you set them down for a limited time. Think of them as little surveillance cameras. They can tell you if your enemies are stealing candy bars at the back of the store. Your enemies cannot see them and you cannot see your enemies wards unless you have a sweeper or a control ward such as this beautiful thing here. A control ward is a ward that can be seen by everyone but it denies vision to enemy wards. This is the part of the movie where they ask their hacker friend to turn the camera off, cameras off. A sweeper is an item available to everyone for free in the item shop, which sweeps a small area of all enemy wards within that area. Once you have used the sweeper, you must wait a limited time before you can use it again. Vision is one of the ways that makes League of Legends a lot like chess. Planning ahead for certain objectives, clearing the vision around that area, and setting up your own wards to see if the enemy is coming. Oh, and of course, flipping the table when you lose. The ways in which a team may approach a game is constantly evolving. However, here are a few basic strategies that squads may employ throughout a match. To start, we have the split push. The split push strategy is probably the most appealing to the eye when you see it live. It revolves around the top laner pushing down a lane by himself while the rest of his team is trying to create a distraction. This looks appealing to the enemy because they're like, hey, we can fight this team five versus four and potentially win while the top laner is off doing his own thing. The problem is, is that doing his own thing might cost you the Nexus. Protect the ADC is another strategy that relies heavily on picking all the roles to fit in protecting and shielding the attack damage carry or the ADC. Everyone's sole purpose is to keep the ADC alive during 5-on-5 five -five engagements. Regardless of not if they get picked off one by one, putting all your eggs into one basket is rough, especially when the ADC dies first. Next, let's dive into the team fight and skirmish section. Certain compositions of champions will create certain strengths and weaknesses as a whole. Some compositions rely on you to fight only 5-on-5, five -five, preferably around important objectives like Baron or Dragon. If anyone gets singled out or caught away from the action prior to the fight, the whole team falls apart. Some compositions, however, are entirely reliant on you catching people out of position. You can never really face the enemy together as five, so you try to weed them out and separate them. Or you catch one wandering around the jungle, and then you take an objective. Let's take a quick second to rewind to that team fight that we just saw. The five-on-five -five scuffle near the dragon pit. I'm going to break down everything as slow as possible, and rather than talk about what the abilities do, I'll be stating what types of abilities or combos are being used. Let's dive right in. So as we can see here, the red team is taking the dragon. That is going to be the precursor for blue team to try to make an advancement into the river to see if they can maybe pick any of the remaining members off. You see, they don't really have much vision, and they can't see if any of the players are low. 
Orn has come from the top lane and decides to flank this red team and try to catch them in an uncomfortable position. He summons his ultimate ability, a giant running ram that he's going to headbutt into and knock up three members of the red team. This is going to give the blue team an opportunity to see if they can pick off any of the members while they are stunned. Lux uses her ultimate, which is called Final Spark, to do some damage. And you can see there's a lot of damage going on to some of these priority targets. Meanwhile, off to the side, there are some blue members trying to flank as well. Blue team is spreading themselves a little bit thin. This gives Andy the opportunity to go on some priority targets, get them a little low, and now you see the tides of the fight are starting to change over here. The blue members are a little bit lost, not sure who to focus, not sure where to go. Their whole life has been turned flipped upside down. And now Lux is on the retreat. Kha'Zix is trying to finish off whoever he can that's remaining. Ryze has already fallen down there. Now the red team is just going to turn around and focus their attention onto the remaining blue members and see what they can pick off. Whoop. Yes, I understand. That was a little bit crazy. But it's like my grandpa always says. League of Legends is crazy. Why are you playing these games at 2 a.m.? Oh, grandpa. The more I learn about League of Legends, the more I realize this game, like I mentioned earlier, really is an intense game of chess. Without strategy, expect to get absolutely dumpstered. Expect the garbage truck to roll up to your house, drag you away with the rest of the trash. With strategy, expect your teacher, albeit me, to give you a gold star. Welcome back to the question and answer segment. We're going to be running off with the second part where we delve into some of the questions that you might have had for the strategy and gameplay segment. Um, it's a lot to digest, especially with these first two segments uh, being so focused on the actual gameplay. But without further ado, actually, no, forget that. Uh, don't forget about the Gleam giveaway. Uh, we do have some ballots more that you can fill out. There is still the opportunity to enter more and increase your chances of winning that Riot Points gift card, which is fit worth $50, or the Amazon gift card, which is worth $100. And don't forget, the winner will be announced at the end of the show here. So stay tuned for that. Don't you go anywhere. But without further ado, now, without further ado, let's head into some questions from that segment. You might have tons. I got answers. Let's head into the first one. From Twitch, we got at Pozak who asks, how has Baron Buff changed throughout the game's his history? Personally, I haven't been playing throughout the whole of League of Legends' history. And from my understanding, it's, it's always relatively been the same. Um, they might have had ma minor tweaks here and there, but I think Baron has been one of those things that League of Legends has been like, you know what, this is, like, this is fine. This is a good thing that we got going on. Let's not try to mess it up. I think Baron has been relatively okay and... From my knowledge, I don't know if there's anything that has been like majorly changed. The only major change has been adding Rift Herald, but that's not really a Baron buff. That's his younger cousin, Rifty. Um, but without, let's let's head into another question. Um, we got from Imperial Monster on Twitch: How has the game changed? To five bands changed the game. So what this question is reference to uh, is reference to kind of that first section uh, where we talk about pick and ban. And in the beginning, there was, there was probably, there, were, there obviously wasn't 139 champions. Riot has been adding champions year, month over month, year over year. Um, and while it is at 139, 140 now, before it was probably at like 100 or like even less, I think the starting number was probably around like 50, um, something, something crazy like that. So initially you were able to ban three champions and then now you're at a stage where you can ban five champions. Frankly, I think it's, it's, it's definitely a good change that people have been asking for qu for quite some time. Um, but the problem is, is that it's not entirely productive. It's productive in, um, in tournament setting, which we will talk a little bit about later, uh, the League of Legends tournaments and the leagues and all the professional players that are associated with it. But when you're playing the game by yourself, it's not super effective because like one team bans five, the other team bans five, but you're not able to see what they ban. So there, there's some strategic element that's been removed because, well, if you can't see what they're banning and they don't know what you're banning, you guys might ban the same thing and in turn it won't total out to 10 champions banned. Whereas in tournament setting, it's like three bans each 
and then there's like a section where there's like two more bands. It's it's it's, it's more it's more strategic in essence. But at the moment, it's it's not like it's not it's not ideal, but it's pretty good. It, um, it's pretty good. Next question we've got from I'm Mick. I'm Mike. I'm Mick Mike from Twitch. I keep hearing people talk about nerfs. What do nerfs do? Um, so in League of Legends, there's buffs and there's nerfs um, in the context of changing the game and in the context of actual in-game. So outside of the game, when Riot makes a champion less effective through their patch notes or through changing the game, that's called a nerf. So for example, if they made a particular champion or character do less damage, that is considered a nerf because they're like, okay, this champion is just too crazy, it's doing too much damage, let's, let's, let's turn it down a notch. Whereas if there's a champion that's like, hey, like this champion is not winning, no one's using it, let's give it a quality of life change, let's buff it up, let's give it, um, let's, let's, let's make some of the abilities stronger, let's make the cooldowns shorter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they're, they're bumping it up a little bit. Um, we got another question from I'm Mike. Mike, Mike, Mike man, you, you ask it all the questions, baby. Uh, why do they update the game so often? Keep it fresh. You got to keep the game fresh. If the game has been the same for the past seven years, people would not be playing this, this game. People will, would consider this hot garbage and wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. But to keep the game interesting, to keep professional players on their toes, to keep, like, I understand that something like basketball or hockey or football, a sport that has been the same relatively for years and years and years is still entertaining to some. With League of Legends, I think that that would have killed the game completely. Maybe, maybe, it's debatable. Um, there's, you know, some of you might have heard about PUBG or something like that, and it's a lot of fun. And the game's not really changing too much, but they're still changing the game, but the concept the same, is the same. Whereas for League, the concept has always been the same to destroy the Nexus. Remember Nexus? You gotta kill it to win the game. The Nexus, the way that you go about it has always been changing, and that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, we have a question from Indica. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, from Facebook. I'm not very good at League of Legends. Will they include microtransactions so I can start winning? Can you, can you, get, a, can you get a load of this guy or girl, male or female? Microtransactions are what absolutely kills some games. Um, the fact that they're making it all surrounding aesthetics and they're making the game look better. Overwatch does that, PUBG kind of does that. If the only thing that you should be doing, the only thing that you should be using for your microtransactions are definitely aesthetics. Like you should not, as a, as a game developer, if, 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 if Riot Games is watching, do not do, not do that. Um, I think that if you add microtransactions to start winning, you'll end up like Star Wars and what they've got going on with Battlefront and hey, how, how you have to pay to get Darth Vader. You have to pay to get Darth Vader. Like, that's ridiculous. That is absolutely bonkers. Um, anyways, thank you for your question. I, that's, that's, you bring up a good point. Uh, let's, now we're going to move on to our last question of this question and answer period. Again from I'm Mike. My goodness gracious. Um, can you have a team of all the same champions? That, that one's a beauty. That one's a beauty. Um, what they have done is they've created some really, really fun game modes. Um, so, like, for example, there's a game mode where everybody's cooldown is 80%, so you can just spam your abilities and it's just a hot mess. Um, another one that they've created is called All for One, and pretty much what that is is your team votes for one champion and you guys all play that one champion. So there is a game mode like that, but it's not played professionally. It's primarily just for fun. They're gonna do that at All Stars um, throughout this weekend, um, most likely. It's, it's primarily just for fun. Like it's for shiz and giggles. Um, but before we head on into our next segment, which is called Broadcast and Sponsorship, I do wanna, again, one more time, uh, urge you that in the, in the next 15 minutes, Gleam polls will close down, so get your ballots in. We, add, we have added some more ballots uh, prior to the show, so make sure that to increase your chances of winning, Amazon gift card, Riot Points, we got it all. Let's head into our next section. Let's go. So you've learned how to play League of Legends, kind of. We don't really expect you to pick up the game and start becoming the next Michael Jordan of League of Legends. Sadly, that role has been filled. We stopped 
accepting applications last week. Sorry. One of the main purposes of Esports 101 is to teach you how to consume esports. We've talked about the game, but we need to talk about the broadcast. Where does competitive League of Legends live? How can I watch? Where? What? Why? When? We've got you covered. The name of where esports lives sounds like something you do when you're running a bit low on sleep, but it is the lifeblood of esports, Twitch. Some argue that this is the new YouTube. You can stream yourself painting. You know, maybe if you want to have your own cooking show, or strangely enough, get this, going to the grocery store. But originally this platform started out as a video game streaming site. In a nutshell, you watch other people play video games, and you connect with the person on the other side of the screen. All these personalities have their own active chats. They can set up their own emojis of their own faces. They have perks for subscribing to them. The list goes on. Riot Games, the developer of League of Legends, owns their own Twitch accounts, a Twitch account for each region of competitive play. However, navigating Twitch on your own might be difficult the first time, but I think you'll get used to it. We would recommend starting from Riot's own esports portal, www.lolesports.com. This site essentially tells you the schedule, allows you to watch Twitch embedded right there in their site, and alongside have some live stats right there for you. Doesn't get better than that other than those nasty commercials. Sometimes all you need is a perfect plunge and a perfect rectangle of water. The broadcast starts off like any other sports broadcast. Fancy bumper, pre-game banter, analyst desk, the concoction that you all know and love. But once the players are on the stage, that's where it becomes a little different. You might have never seen a League of Legends stage before. Whether large-scale championships or regular season games, Riot works hard to polish the production. Players start, you know, on each team, are all seated in five side-by-side -side computers. They all have cameras attached to their monitors that display their faces in front of some more monitors. And get this, referees standing right there behind them. Bet you didn't think there needed to be a referee. On occasion, there might be a pause, whether it is in-game bug or device-related, mouse stop working, sprained ankle. I'm just joking about that last one, don't worry. During these pauses, players are not allowed to talk to one another, and there are other responsibilities for a referee, but an example always helps to paint a picture. The pick and ban screen looks a lot different than the one in-game. You know, we have champions here on the side, statistics on the bottom, and you'll see even some visuals in the middle. This all seems basic from a digestion standpoint, but the seafood sliders are going down the esophagus smoothly. But seeing this for the first time will help when seeing it the next time. The in-game footage is obviously the same from what we have shown, but the before and after are important to showcase. Sometimes they're post-game interviews, and sometimes there's even beautiful trash talk that even Shakespeare would be proud of. And then they move on to the next game and do it all again. While we do not expect you to play League of Legends, it would be wonderful if you found an appreciation for the game and maybe watched even a few games yourself. Maybe you're looking to connect with a significant other, or maybe your son or daughter idolizes a personality that plays League of Legends. Whatever the flavor, the goal is for you at home to recognize the importance of esports, and particularly today, League of Legends. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment you have all been waiting for. The money, the moolah, the cake, the Gucci, the Fendi, as of late, people have two thoughts associated with esports in general. The first being Mountain Dew, the second being Doritos, the third being spo sp sponsorship. I guess, I guess that's three thoughts. Don't believe me? Let's just list a few of our homies involved in esports and see what they're all about. First, let's start with Rick Fox, who used to be a player on the Lakers during the Kobe era. How about let's just throw J-Lo into the mix? How about that? Maybe even some Marshawn Lynch or sprinkle a little Shaquille O'Neal. All of them have more than $15 million in a team. The 76ers and the Miami Heat also own quite the stake in their own respective teams. And you know what? Sure, let's just, let's just throw in Steve Aoki. Why not? Yeah, he owns his own team. He gets a team. You know who else gets a team? Jeremy Lin gets a team. And so does Magic Johnson. He also gets a team. The list goes on, folks. But let's get into some League of Legends specific examples and all the teams associated with the leagues. Team sponsorship doesn't mean that the company has a stake or deeply rooted role in managing a team. It just means here, have some money, slap your logo on a computer, maybe your face. Sponsors are trying their darndest to reach a demographic that has up until now seemed impossible to reach. 
This dark and gray area of 18 to 30, where individuals are so offended by commercials and integrated content sponsorship. By the way, this is the perfect moment to mention that today's episode of Esports 101 has been brought to you by... I'm, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. There are so many instances of interesting activations, whether accidental or purposeful, they have hit their mark. Let's take a look at some quick examples. For starters, Team Liquid's owner, Liquid112, answering his phone during an interview. Or how about T-Mobile's activation with two-star athletes and C9 Sneaky and TSM Bjergsen? Or how about Gillette's personable package for Team Solo Mid? And dare I say, those razors are looking sharp. There's no shortage of involvement from brands as they activate strategically. And there's also an interesting list of sponsors that teams work alongside. League of Legends teams in particular have involvement from here on the side. We've got Red Bull, T-Mobile, Brisk. Really, the list goes on and on and on. Team investment is a whole nother ball game, however. It has nothing to do with activating a brand within a team, but rather a stake is given up or the ownership of the organization. Some big wig has a lot of money, wants money back later, gives the team money, says, enjoy kids, go play. Like a barbecuing dad at a backyard kickback, these big wigs just provide what is essential for their kids to have a swell time. This is where investment gets super spicy. The type of people involved are strange, and you generally only hear about these individuals in BuzzFeedy articles saying, Wow, Mark Wahlberg sponsors esports, woo! He doesn't actually. But let's list some of the people involved just to give you a little bit of a taste. For starters, we've got a team like Cloud9, has investors from Reddit and the WWE, as well as players like Joe Montana and Hunter Pence. CLG has investment from Madison Square Garden. Echo Fox's primary stakeholder is a man we already talked about, Rick Fox. FlyQuest is owned by Wesley Eddins, a co-owner of the Milwaukee Bucks. Clutch Gaming, also owned by a respective team, Houston Rockets. And last, but definitely not least, 100 Thieves, owned by the Cavaliers. There's obviously a huge involvement from NBA teams and the structure that they provide. These esports organizations is quite crucial. League of Legends is very similar in the sense that games are five on five, there are star roles, there are supportive roles. Doesn't get better than that. As far as sponsorship is concerned, the broadcast space is the last alley we have yet to talk about. Kind of tough one with all these stray cats pawing at our feet, but let's dive right in. Riot has been very reluctant to get anyone involved because the community is so aggressive. If they see some branded content, they just scream sellout. Recently, however, they have had a change of heart, which also happens to be my favorite Yu-Gi-Oh card. For starters, MLB and Disney both own streaming rights to League of Legends. Yes, baseball and a poorly drawn mouse own the ability to stream League of Legends. Crazy world we live in. Next, we've got branded content. This past World Championship, we saw segments like the Acer Predator replay and T-Mobile's Best of the Rift. This is the type of thing that the community tends to stray away from. However, during the World Championships, it is all how the host handled it. And frankly, the host did a superb job of segueing. Littered throughout the world, they also had Coca-Cola World Championship viewing parties. If you and your friends wanted to watch League of Legends with a bunch of other like-minded individuals, you could do that in theaters across the globe. I think that's kind of neat. Like imagine planning Super Bowl parties across the world that were sponsored by the Super Bowl or in essence organized by the league. This wasn't really a super long list of sponsors, but it is just a snapshot of what Riot tends to think about when they are dancing the fine line between cringe and sponsorship. Welcome back to the question and answer segment. This is going to be the third one where we're going to be answering, again, some of the questions that you might have burning inside you after that broadcast and sponsorship segment. But before I dive in, you know, you know, you know exactly what I'm about to say. Gleam giveaway. At 9 o'clock, the Gleam giveaway does shut off, and we will pick a winner at the end of the stream. So remember, we have added more ballots. If you want to, if you want to get those ballots, if you want to increase your chance of getting that $100 Amazon gift card as well as the, those... $50 riot points, make sure to check out the Gleam campaign in the panel below or on Facebook. It is in the comment. And of course, make sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and follow us here on Twitch. Without further ado, let's dive right back into those questions that you have so 
desperately wanted answers for. Let's start off with a Facebook question from Joe Recupero. Uh, will eSports make it into the Olympics in my lifetime? Now, sir, um, not sure how old you are. I'll, I'll put that out there. I'm just going to slide that one on the table. But uh, let's hypothetically say, I'm going to use my grandparents as an example. My grandparents are around 70. I'm not saying that you're my grandpa. I'm just saying, let's use my grandparents as an example. Because that's a perfect example. Grandparents across the world might be like, hey, is my kid going to be an Olympian by playing video games? We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Right now, the Olympics committees across the world, whatever, the IOC, are in the process of kind of debating and thinking about, hey, do we add esports into the mix? Like, what do we do? How do we do it? When do we do it? My guess is as good as this. After, so right now we're in, what, 2017? The next Olympics is 2018? The Winter Olympics, 2018? So I would say it's a really safe bet to even guess 2026. If, if eSports, if they've been thinking brewing in the back, brewing in the shed, cooking up a concoction, 2026, the latest, is when you'll see. 2022 is like a little bit of a, like a, a, like a rough guess. They're probably still going to be thinking about it. But 2026, I can, I can guarantee you, if that eSports isn't in the Olympics, there's going to be like an eSports Olympics where they have all the titles and you can come out and it'll run simultaneously during the Olympics. I mean, that's just an idea that I have. Maybe they might even go as so far as to actually add Olympics, I mean, eSports into the Olympics. But I think it would be much better if eSports had their own Olympics. And there was all the titles listed out and people came and there was, it was like a world, world championship, so to speak. Moving on to our next question. This one, this one comes from Twitch from Nick from Shoppers. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's a great username. Do you think League of Legends will make a big impact on television? No. The answer is, well, esports doesn't need television. And we're proving it right here. We're teaching you League of Legends. We're teaching you concepts. We're teaching you everything that you need to know in, you know, a little bit of a dinner plate size. It's not a snack size, that's for sure. It's definitely like a dinner plate. And we're doing it live from Facebook and we're doing it live from Twitch. And if that's any, if that's any proof is that esports doesn't really need TV. In fact, I think TV needs esports more than it needs it, if that makes any sense. Carry the one. Um, yeah, no, I, to, to put that plainly, esports doesn't need TV. Next question, moving on. Why can't the players just look up at the Jumbotron and see where their opponents are? Esports likes to do these little rooms, um, not necessarily all the time, but as you saw in that, you know, let's pull up that last clip just to kind of give you an example of, um, yeah, that's, you know, we'll use that one. That one's fine. Let's head on over to our teaching segment. Let's have a quick kind of look at this. As you can see, there's kind of like, you know, all the players are lined out and you might even see that there's like a jumbotron kind of in between the two lines of five players. You see, they've got these soundproof headsets on. Um, and before, in some other tournaments, there used to be a three-minute delay on some of these video games that were played competitively. And that delay would allow these players to kind of be a little bit behind, almost in a sense. Um, but in, in the case now where it's actually live, and there is no more three-minute delay, um, these, these players are just so micro-focused in what they're doing at that particular moment in time that they really have no need to look at the Jumbotron. And moreover, there's referees behind them. In that last segment, I did outline that there are referees that are constantly behind them, making sure that they're following the summoner's code, um, and they're making sure that they're abiding by the rules that are in their contract to play competitively for the leagues. So although they probably wish they could look at the Jumbotron, the real answer is that they'd probably get fined or disqualified. Let's head on over back to our question and answer uh, little zone and see what other questions we got lined up. Another question we have is, are esports players paid or do, do, or do they just win prize money? Great question. Um, it's frankly a little bit of both. Um, esports players, they tend to, um, these playoffs and these championships and these tournaments that they attend to and the, the leagues that they're a part of, the prize money is really not where they make most of their money. I mean, it's a, it's a good chunk, but divided that, divide that chunk against five people. Let's say they win $100,000 for the North American region alone. Um, the World Championship's more than a million, but if they win the North American region alone, 
and it's like $100,000 divided by against five people. Like it's not a lot. It's not a lot to just live off of. A lot of where they make their money is from the contracts that they sign. They sign million dollar contracts. We're starting to approach that space. They're making money from streaming. So when we talked a little bit about that in our first section with the broadcast uh, and how you can watch people play video games, they make money there because people can donate, people can uh, subscribe, people can give, throw money at these people. Um, and I really think they make money a lot from sponsorships, from brands, from activations, because people are like, these people have a voice, I wanna give them money to exercise their voice, to really use their voice uh, to sell my product. Um, so realistically, they make money from winning, but it's really not the big chunk of how much they could actually be making if they're streaming, if they're um, engaging with advertising, if they're engaging with sponsors, whatever, and what have you. Um, next question. Is there a salary cap in League of Legends competitive play? Not from what I know so far. If anything, the, we're heading into franchising in 2018 with League of Legends. Riot Games has decided that they want to create player associations and they want to head into franchising and the model and you have to invest like 13 million for a team, like it's quite the process. But now we've obviously solidified those 10 teams and those 10 teams are ready to go. We talked a little bit about that in our last section. But um, for the time being with this franchising model, they're just trying to grow. They're just trying to expand the, the game. They're just trying to expand the product and to do that, they need to increase salary caps, essentially. Not, well, there's no salary cap, but they just need to increase the amount that our salaries are being traded at. Right now, it's in the millions. Could I see it in the double digit millions in like the 10, 20, 30s? Soon. But like, it's gonna be probably another five, 10 years before we see the reality of that. But, I mean, it also depends on how successful this franchise model is. If it flops, contracts are gonna go down the chute. If it does well, contracts are gonna get inflated fast. But that's, that's, that's all I'll know as we have yet to see the success of the franchise model with League of Legends. Last question for the segment before we move on into talking a little bit about tournaments and leagues. Uh, we've got a question from Nolan Cantel from Facebook. What kind of league do these sponsored LOL teams compete in? Well, I'm not going to you know, give too much away as we're getting into that in a little bit. But there is, for League of Legends, only one league that they compete in. There's a spring spring split, there's a summer split. In between those two splits, there's like a little tournament, a little international tournament uh, that helps decide seeding for the world championships, which happens to be after the summer split. Um, and it's pretty much the developer of the game, Riot Games, that just continuously uh, has a hold on the league and has um, all their ducks in a row. And they pretty much own the entire thing. And they're the broadcaster, they're the commissioner, they're the developer. So. Um, that's actually a great time to segue into our next section, Tournaments and Leagues. I wish to make it easy, I mean there's a preseason, one big tournament at the end, a big cup or a big ring and lots of confetti. Sadly, that's not how League of Legends works. Mind you, Every esports is different in how players and teams are ranked worldwide and how their performance changes from event to event. Some game developers like lots of tournaments and invitationals sprinkled throughout the year, whereas some like concrete leagues and frankly, some developers like a mixed boat, which is just as fine. I'm going to explain from start to finish how you and a rag and tag team can make it to the World Championships for League of Legends. January 1st, normally you'd pop the champagne, but you're only 18. You gather around your whole family and you tell them your New Year's resolution. You want to be the best League of Legends player in the world. Your mom starts crying and your dad storms out, but let's get into how this dream can become a reality within one year. With League of Legends entering into the NBA franchise model, it's a little difficult to say how things might work since they haven't really happened yet. There are the main teams in the North American League Championship Series, or NALCS for short, these are the teams participating. And each team also owns an academy team. So there's a major league and there's a minor league with 10 teams a pop per league. Pretty simple, right? To get on an academy team, you must either A, get signed, or B, there's now gonna be an NBA style draft at the end of the year. Let's hypothetically say you got picked up from the draft, which is where this resolution came from. And you were so damn good and exceeded so many expectations, but 
Man, where did you come from? Let's sign you to a team. Congratulations. You're now in the NALCS. You and nine other teams now play in a spring split, the first season of the year. Every other region will also have a spring split that they will compete in as well. The top two teams with the best seasonal record are automatically seeded into the semifinals of the playoffs and await their opponents there. The team that wins the playoff bracket is then sent to the midseason invitational. The top six teams after the playoffs receive championship points. The higher the placing, the more points the team receives. The first place team also receives them and the most obviously remember these championship points. They will be handy later. Your team has won the NALCS playoffs, held the trophy high through the confetti. Your entire team rushes out to celebrate with you. Let's not stop there, because next week, y'all are flying out to the midseason invitational. This holds importance for the world championships. One team from the core regions, North America, Europe, Korea, and China, are sent alongside eight of the wildcard teams from smaller regions. The World Championships seeds teams based on performance. There are first seed, second seed, and third seed teams. A lot of the third seed teams must compete in a play-in round robin stage prior to the World Championship group stage. They gotta go through all that just to get to the group stage. This seems like a lot of information, but I think it needs to be explained. So that was the meat and potatoes, and for the vegans out there, here's a little quinoa as well. Regularly, a region sends one of each string, seed rather. If your team wins the midseason invitational, your region will foster one seed and two second seeds. Also, a pride and a chocolate bar will come in the package too. This also eliminates your need for a third string. Makes competition a lot easier for you in theory. If your team loses terribly bottom of the pack, down and out, and once again fail to get the Krabby Patty recipe, your region will not foster a first seed. Rather, your team will send two second seeds, and the third seed will have to compete in the play-in stage. All the rest of the teams in between will still foster one first seed, one second seed, and a third seed to compete in the play-in stage. For a mental picture, this is what I mean when I say a team wins, loses, and middles at MSI. After the 12 teams that are sent to duke it out, only six remain for a small playoff bracket. This is the mental picture that I was referring to, actually painted. The team, we went out, but we're not really too happy with our performance. We're upset, but what counts is that we weren't last at the midseason invitational, and frankly, that's all that matters. Those damn Koreans, so good at League of Legends. Within a few weeks, the summer split now begins for the NALCS. This season's for all the marbles. Whoever wins this will be the first seed sent to the World Championship. After the playoffs, more championship points are distributed. Whoever has the most championship points will be the second seeded team to attend the World Championships. Last but definitely not least, for the third seed, we have what's called the gauntlet. There should be now four remaining teams with a decent amount of championship points. They are slotted into a bracket with the team with the most remaining points waiting at the end and the two teams with the lowest amount of points of the four duking it out first. The winner of that plays the team with the second highest championship point count, and the winner of that faces the team waiting at the end. The winner of that is only the third seed sent to the playing stage prior to the World Championship group stage. <sighs> the World Championship is quite simple, as if anything I've said in the past couple minutes has been simple. There are 12 wildcard and three third seeded teams that compete in the playing stage. Couple of quick maths, and that's four teams to qualify for the actual group stage. In the group stage, there are four groups with four teams. Everybody plays each other twice, and the top two move on to the quarterfinals. From there, it's a standard playoff bracket until a world champion is crowned and is awarded millions of dollars. I honestly didn't think we would get this far. The League of Legends format is such a mouthful to explain, but we made it. Mind you, this is just the format for League of Legends. As I mentioned earlier, eSports in general has support for so many different formats. Funny enough, League of Legends is probably the most intricate and sometimes the most infuriating. As the kids say, LOL. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You've got questions, and guess what? 
I've got answers. But before I go any further, while I do every single time with the Q&A segment, I say Glean Giveaway, I think the polls are now closed. So any of the ballots that you've entered are now, we're going to announce the winner after the next segment, after the next Q&A. We'll get there soon. But like I said earlier, don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Twitch. But without further ado, let's get back to some, some questions. I've got some answers. Let's dive in. We got a question from Dennis on Facebook. Let's start things off with something spicy. How soon will training houses become common in esports? It's funny that you say that, that this is already almost a thing. So let's use League of Legends as our primary example. Every now and then, a team gets put together and they think, hey, we want to be a good team, right? We want to be the best team possible, right? So what they do is that because Koreans are the best League of Legends player, or the best region rather, I think, like if League of Legends had an Olympics, Korea would probably win um, because they're the best. They've won more League of Legends World Championships than any other region. So North American teams tend to be like, hey, we have a good team. We've rounded out really well. Let's get these guys really well uh, suited. Let's get them prepared for the summer split or for the spring split. And they send them to Korea. And they get like a little apartment. And they get five computers. And they, and they practice against other Korean teams. Does this always work? No. Does it work sometimes? Maybe. Has it, has it been a tried and true method that has proved to be useful for teams? Like, for example, before I finish that thought, after the summer split, right before the World Championship, sometimes these teams go to boot camp in Korea, which means before the World Championships, they prep themselves by playing against the best. In that short period of time, however, hasn't always proved useful and it hasn't always reached the results that North American teams want. They have yet to make it to the semifinals excluding year one. It's been six or seven years since NA has yet to make it to the semifinals. Anyways, I hope that answers your question. Let's move on to the next one. Facebook, Joe. What is the biggest and most prestigious money prize someone can win at eSports? This expands League of Legends. This does not sit right here. If, you're, if you want to talk about tournament prize winnings, you automatically got to set your sights on Dota 2. Let me just actually quickly Google this. Excuse me, really, I'm just going to quickly... I, want, I don't want to butcher uh, the amount, but every year, Dota 2 has their own world championship, and it's called the International. In 2017, the total prize pool was $24 million total, almost $25 million. First place, how much did first place win? $10.8 million. I hope that, I, I think that legitimately answers your questions. Prize pools have consistently been growing year over year, but currently to date, that is the biggest amount of money a team has won. 10.8 million. Divided against five players, Dota 2 is a five player, five on five game. 10 million, if you actually divide that, that's two million per player. That means they played video games and they won two million dollars per player. Pretty handy. Let's move on to another question from Shark Kangaroo on Twitch. Who is your grammar correction? What is your favorite League of Legends team? And who do you think, and how do you think they'll do this year? If you know me, and you know who I am, and you know um, what I'm all about, I'm all about Cloud9, baby. I'm all about Cloud9. They have been probably my favorite team ever since they've entered the league when they were Quantic Gaming in the qualifier, when they got into the NALCS, when they got into the North American League Championship Series, Cloud9 has always been putting on a show, putting on an entertaining, exotic dance in front of all eyes to see, and I've always been supporting them, even during their lowest lows. How do I think they're gonna do this split? They let go of their top laner, they let go of their jungler. They're, they have an, another home now. They didn't import. They did not import. In fact, they just took Sven Skarin and they put him on TSM. I mean, they, put, they took Sven Skarin from TSM and put him on Cloud9. Now they've got a, a local talent top laner. They're rounding up their academy team. How do I think they'll do? It's tough. You had contracts. He was a local talent. You had contracts. Like, did he get bought out? Did he get sold? Did they not want him? Did they think Sven Skarin was valued more than contracts? It's honestly tough to say. Do I see this Cloud9 roster being a top, top five? Yes. Do I see them being top three? 
now it's become debatable. Without your solid rock and impact in the top lane, it might be tough to round out a good roster. But anyways, hope that answers your question. We're going to move on to Pozak from Twitch. What do you think about the idea of adding voice chat to League of Legends like CSGO? We actually have had recent news. Riot has been kind of hush-hush about this whole voice chat thing because it's been quite the debate for a lot of people. They've been like, ah, I don't like voice chat, like, or it's going to be too toxic or it's going to be too much. Voice chat is coming to soon to League of Legends, but the way that they're doing it is that you can only communicate with people that you know. So you can't communicate with randoms. They have to be in your party. If you have ever played Xbox, that's pretty much what they're doing. The party system, where you've had people that can join your party, leave your party, that is what League of Legends is doing. Do I think that's good? More or less. Do I think ha being able to talk to the enemy and being able to talk to you know, your other teammates who are not your friends, who are not in your party, would be helpful? Maybe. But at the moment, I think this is just a good direction to get it like um, in a space where you can get people comfortable with voice chat, and then you can just introduce the rest after. Um, Savannah, how do these pro teams get put together initially? It's a great question. North America, has, and we'll talk a little bit about that in our next segment, um, the seven deadly sins of league, but North America has decided to put a region lock on NA. What that means is teams are only allowed two imports to fill up their roster, which means that there's five players, which means they can have two Koreans if they want, and then three North Americans. They can really do whatever they want. Or they can have some Europeans. Europeans have some really, really good mid laners. Um, that import rule has rounded out teams in primarily. So they'll put together the people who they want to import first, and then they'll add the rest after, because their priority is to get like the best import possible. If they want to import the Michael Jordan from Korea, they're going to do that, and they're going to build the team around him. Um, other than that, in League of Legends, there are challenger ladders, which means that it's the top 200 players of each region. That, like, that's where they compete. They compete at the very, very top. Um, and it's, it's, it's not like competitive. Like, it's not, uh, you don't get money for it. Like, it's just the ranking system in League. And a lot of the times, teams will look to those challenger uh, regions or they'll look at those challenger ladders in those regions and they'll pick players from there if they think that they can fit in the roster well. Last question for this segment we've got from Twitch from Insert Abel here. Thanks for coming out, good old buddy of mine. Do you believe the Academy League will help build domestic talent or will imports always be a better option? This is something I've kind of been thinking about recently. Uh, me and one of my other co-commentators that commentate League of Legends regularly, we've discussed that the, the introduction of the academy teams is kind of, in, in, in other words, it's made like a minor league, right? There's a major league and there's a minor league. So now that there's a minor league, the amateur scene is dead because Riot Games has developed their own amateur scene. Now that you have a structured amateur scene, people who want to become pro have an opportunity to become amateurs. And now you have this, this area where people who are like, nah, I can't go pro, there's no space for me, I'm not going to fit in a team, all the teams are full. Now that there's an academy league, you can foster new talent, you can create opportunities for these players who are like, I don't want to be pro. Now they have an opportunity to be pro, they have an opportunity to be, to be motivated, and they're getting paid while doing it, I think that this is going to grow local talent immensely. But I um, hope that answers your question. Uh, we're now going to head into our next segment, which is called The Seven Deadly Sins of League. Many years ago, when less intelligent men, women, and beasts walked this earth, Seven deadly sins were brought forward to shun the beings of this planet. Okay, maybe not really. They were based on Christian teachings. But how fun would it be to talk about issues in the League of Legends universe from the perspective of seven deadly sins? Let's start with gluttony. Gluttonous Maximus. The overindulgence and overconsumption of anything to the point of waste. Would you believe me if I told you that it is possible to play too much League of Legends? That, well, there was, was a time where players had to compete in back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back tournaments. 
And from a geographical perspective, not all of them were super close to one another. Players had to deal with jet lag on top of playing a bunch of League of Legends. The result? Stress, burnout, depression. The mental aspect of things can absolutely destroy a team, especially if someone loses their passion for the game that's putting a roof over their head. Head, shoulders, knees, and desire. De desire, wait, wait, that's not how the song goes. Lust and the intense longing can absolutely destroy a player's trajectory to be one of the greats. Let's talk about Mitch Crepo Vorspools. Now, whatever I say in this portion, he is a changed man and he has made decisions for the better. The celebrity life is a dangerous one. Some of these players are household names to the young. They see these commentators and players and scream like infectious believers. Crepo was a player turned analyst, which is common in the sports world. However, during the Midseason Invitational in 2016, Crepo was forced to step down from the broadcast because his nudes were leaked on the internet. The real reason he left, however, was because these nudes in question were sent to an underage female. That is where the cookie crumbles and stays underneath the oven till the end of time. Money A, money A, must be funny A. Well, the rich man's world is filled with it. It has plagued the League of Legends competitive leagues. You want to start a competitive yo-yo club? Wouldn't you want the best yo-yoers? Would you pay them to join your club? Maybe you can convince them by sharing some of your Oreos. North America as a region is always trying to improve by importing players and paying them a lot of money. Where do they find the top talent? Korea. One of the largest player contracts in the league right now is valued at $1 million. And yes, he is Korean. These players are valued so highly because you can safely bet a Korean team will win the world championship. Realistically, these players probably don't care about a world title. They're just here for the money. You might be your mama's pride and joy, but that doesn't really mean you get to have your cake and eat it too. Pride is the Achilles heel to everyone but Donald Trump it seems, but also Joshua Dardock Harnett might be the only other exception. From January 2016 to now, Dardock has been on five different teams. Every single time he's been let go, it was because, well, Dardock was unwilling to adhere to the set of standards expected of every member of the team. In other words, eSports, I think, has its first Allen Iverson. Maybe he thinks he's the best jungler in North America. Maybe he feels compelled to not practice. Maybe he might have too much pride to pick a certain champion for his team. This complex is prevalent in a few players, not a concerning amount, I hope. League of Legends' wrath is toxicity. The degree to which a uh, chemical substance or a particular mixture of subs... Wait, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. A toxic individual is one who constantly creates a bad atmosphere for others they are playing with. I wish I could just talk about one player, but the list is ridiculous, to the point that Riot has either fined or banned these players from competitive play, either indefinitely or for a short time. Let's go through a short list. Jensen, to start off our list, was banned for DDoSing, or in other words, hacking the game to make it unplayable for other players. He had a two-year ban that has since been lifted. Sven Skarin was fined $2,500 for racial slurs while playing internationally. Mithy was banned for verbal abuse and offensive in-game behavior he had a one-year ban as well that has also since been lifted. And last, but definitely not least, Vasily has been banned till 2020 for physical violence and death threats against his own girlfriend after she made a few supportive comments about his gameplay. But I mean, hey, guys, come on. It's just game. Why you have to be mad? Sometimes all we need after a long day is a pair of sweatpants, a bucket of ice cream, and maybe some Netflix. Doesn't that sound like the life? Well, esports players are human too and they want to experience some luxuries. Enter G2 Esports, a prestigious esports team sponsored by Logitech, PaySafeCard, HyperX, and recently, our boy Fernando Alonso. Rewind to the 2016 Midseason Invitational. Prior to the competition, G2 thought, hey, let's not practice, let's just take a vacation. Just a reminder, winners of, these, of this tournament get seeded better at the World Championship. The trick is you're helping your region, not just yourself. Let's just say that they went two and eight. What would you do to be the best at what you loved? Would you train really hard? Would you try to find cheat codes or cheats to get there? Or would you 
take steroids. Well, League of Legends doesn't really have steroids, but we do have a Michael Jordan. Enter Lee Faker Sang Yuk. He probably has one of the most expensive League of Legends contracts to date, and it would be more if he put his loyalty aside and left the team he's been on for years. The focus, however, is not on League of Legends as Michael Jordan, but rather everyone that wants to take him out. Songs and praises only come to those that attempt to dethrone him. Even when he's winning, I mean, even when he's losing, he's still winning. Mid laners across the world aspire to be like him and play at his caliber. Outside looking in, you might think that these players live in their mother's basement and they eat Doritos all day long. It is very obvious that that preconceived stigma has died. These players have incredible highs, and as evident by this segment, terrifying lows. It's with such sad sorrow that we have to go through our last Q&A together of this wonderful lecture. Um, but after this Q&A section, we will announce the winner of the Gleam giveaway. But before we get there, let's answer some of the questions that you might have had from that last segment. And I'll give you some answers. Don't worry, I got you. The first question that we had from that section uh, was, would you consider Adderall to be an eSports steroid? Frankly, not really. Um, there was a time where there was a team, there was a Counter-Strike team that came out and they had said that during a tournament they used Adderall completely. Like the, 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 throughout, throughout the entire tournament they used Adderall. But one of the drawbacks of that was that they weren't able to communicate together that well. And a lot of teams are more or less team oriented. If you're not communicating what player is coming up, why, where are you gonna post up, where's the layup going, you're really not going to have a good time. These players uh, were so, like not hooked on Adderall, but they were so in the zone, and that's what Adderall really does. It puts you in the zone, and you're just so focused on every detail in the game, but you're not really communicating with who's beside you, and that might be one of the drawbacks. You're not able to focus. You're not able to communicate what you're about to do, but you might be really damn good at doing what you're doing. You just not, might not be able to voice it, uh, which is probably one of the drawbacks. But nevertheless, it has been banned across pretty much all Esports. So, if there's, I mean, I guess it does have some negative things that Riot or any other game developer would not want to see. Moving on to our next question, uh, somebody asks, which champions is Faker best with? I, I think that that list is growing all the time. Um, he's definitely somebody who tries to expand the list of champions that he's always playing. He always wants to be at the top of his game. He always wants to be the best. And to be the best, you have to be able to play almost everything. Um, I would say a lot of people know him for his Zed. A lot of people know him for his Orianna. A lot of people know him for um, maybe playing a little bit of Victor. Um, it's, it's primarily control mages that I think he's really good at. But he can also play assassins like Zed and Fizz every now and then. Um, but his team is always putting their trust in him with whatever he wants to play um, in order to win. Next question we got is, is there a max amount of years you can play? Yes and no. Um, I think the expiration date of a player is really dependent on what role are they providing for the team. If they are somebody who's very mechanically gifted, if they're a Kobe Bryant, if they're a Michael Jordan, um, but they're not a leader, they're just mechanically gifted or they're really gifted in their talents, um, that depends on their risk. That depends on how, um, how fast they are, what their reaction time is like. And the older you get, the, 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 the more it kind of lessens down. So when you're 30, 40, 50, I'm not sure these players are still gonna be playing. But there are players that are in that age range between 25 and 35, which is already starting to get old for esports, but they're providing like a leadership role. They're providing, they're, they're coaching a bunch of young talents and they're making sure that these players are well versed and they know exactly where to be on the map. They know what they should be doing. They know what their job is. And it's really important to have a leader like that, especially somebody who's like a veteran, somebody who knows who's been there, who has had the stage jitters, who has had, you know, the crumble underneath the pressure. So I will have to wait and see what some of the, how, when these players get to a certain age, what is going to become of them because the younger players are always going to be ripe for great talent. Um, last question, sadly, for this 
question and answer period, we've got a question from Sarah on Facebook, and she asks, okay, now that I know the basics of League of Legends, what eSports should I learn next? Well, I can't really tell you what to do, and I, I can suggest a couple of titles, but realistically, the best answer is to wait for another episode of eSports 101, and whatever eSport we teach next, baby, that's where you're going to be. That's where you're going to be. But um, if you wanted to start doing some homework, if you wanted to get a, little, get a head start, do a little research, get your essay ready, get you know, those test notes together, um, CSGO is kind of the next genre you would go to. Maybe Super Smash Brothers Melee is another good eSport to kind of start, get familiar with uh, some of the different genres. It's more genre focused that you should be kind of gearing towards. Um, but that about wraps up like this beautiful, beautiful lecture that we've put together. And I know that all of you have been patiently waiting for the Gleam giveaway, which we've had running for a long period of time. Um, now, mind you, the Gleam giveaway, uh, I don't exactly remember how, uh, how re-rolling works or in case that somebody is here not, not here to claim. In the terms and conditions of the Gleam giveaway, it does state that you need to be present for this Twitch stream or for this Facebook stream. So if we have the option to re-roll, we will continue to do so um, to see. Uh, we will continue to do so until we get somebody who is there live and able to claim. But can I get my, uh, my lovely intern, uh, Victor, to come on over? Thank you, Vic. Great, great job, as always. Um, here we have the proof. Proof in the pudding. Here are the two cards. Uh, and we're going to flip this monitor around just to show you guys the, the screen. I'm going to rip this tape off. Sorry, producers upstairs. And let's see, let's see if we can get this crack lacking. Um, make sure that this, you guys are able to see that there's no degree um, going on with this. Oh, that worked actually quite well. Um, I'll grab my mouse. Perfect. That is beautiful. Thank you, uh, team, for that. So as you can see, here we are on the Gleam page. We have um, the prize right here. There's one prize left, which is exactly these two cards here, which I'm actually just going to place them right here so you guys can, uh, can uh, feel, feel the love, feel the prize. And let's, without further ado, can I get a theoretical uh, electronic drum roll, please? Okay, that's great. Uh, draw. One winner. Alexander Stravesky. Okay, do we have an Alexander in the chat? Do we have an Alexander in the chat? I don't even know how we can tell if my boy Alex is able to claim this or not. Um, what do we think? What are we thinking? Do we just claim Alex? Worst case scenario, ladies and gentlemen, we will contact Alex. And if Alex is unable to accept this gift, what we will do is we will post on Twitter another winner, or we will post on Facebook another winner if Alex is not able to claim the prize. But thank you all for participating in the giveaway. Um, let's say goodbye. It's been such a long time, ladies and gentlemen. We've had so much fun here in the live lecture, but that's going to put a nice bow on the debut of Esports 101. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in, asking questions, engaging with us online. You've been a treat. We hope you learned a thing or two, or three, hopefully four. All of us here at Esports 101 also want to thank Ryerson University and their radio television arts program for their support while we developed this idea and brought it to life. People like Brian Withers, Ryan Sykes, Scott O'Sullivan, and of course, Joe Recupero have done so much for us. Huge kudos goes out to Zach Murray, the owner of Vanquish Media. All that beautiful logo and shenanigans and those motion graphics, Zach, that was all you and your branding of the show, incredible. I also can't forget our kick-ass crew that volunteered to help out. We paid them in pizza, but currency is currency. The show literally could not have been done without them. And finally, speak of the devil, Panago, 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 Panago Pizza for believing in us and providing us with a few delicious meals, especially for our crew. It's tough to pull off a show like that with an empty stomach. We hope to do more episodes, so let us know which game you want us to break down next. 
Uh, we'll see where the next, and we'll see how that goes in the next few months. For everyone here at Esports 101, I'm David Abunovich, and now you know.